Let me give a brief introduction. Um, so uh, Maria is a principal software engineer at Microsoft Quantum, focusing on education and outreach. Uh, Maria is the author of the Quantum Cutoffs Project and organizer of the Q Sharp Coding Contest Series, a part-time lecturer at Northeastern University of Seattle and the author of O'Reilly Q Sharp Pocket Guide. Y'all have heard from him before and uh, uh, we're all really excited to hear from you again. Maria, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Shantana. Yep. So, yeah, uh, if you have participated in Microsoft Challenge, you meet me again. If you have participated in QTX Challenge, you might be actually seeing me for the first time this weekend. Um, let's see. I'm assuming you can see my slides now. Uh, so, uh, I was not really sure what to talk to you about today. Usually I talk to people about Azure Quantum quite a lot. But uh, given that this talk happens after the hackathon, you have already met Azure Quantum quite a lot. So not a lot of things I would tell you about it would be new to you. So I figured out I would take a direction from the um, social hours we had on Friday in Gather Town and cover some of the questions that were asked most frequently uh, about our program, about how to connect with us, how to stay in touch, that kind of things. So I'll try to do it in uh, something like 20 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. Let's see if we can do this. So the uh, required slide about Azure Quantum, which you have already met, but um, now with some extra news that are our latest announcements. Uh, so in Azure Quantum, uh, Microsoft partners with a variety of uh, other companies working on quantum computing and on optimization to uh, basically provide a diverse cloud ecosystem to work on quantum computing and to enable you folks work on quantum computing today. Right now, you probably have seen that already. We have access to hardware of two of our partners, INQ, and you can tell that this picture is two months old because it still says Honeywell uh, Continuum. And uh, we are working to enable two of our more recent partners, QCI and Rigetti. And Zentoshiba and OneCubit are our optimization partners. Now, uh, one of the most frequently asked questions is how does Microsoft Quantum team uh, look like? So our whole team consists of two parts, uh, kind of hardware and software. I personally work on the software side of things. So most everything I'm allowed to tell you is about software. And um, these teams are spread across um, eight labs around the world pretty much. And uh, the location kind of defines what this lab is working on. So our teams in Copenhagen and Delft work on uh, qubit experimentation, device experimentation. The three locations uh, that I would struggle to pronounce today work on materials and fabrication, basically producing the devices uh, to experiment on. Uh, Sydney folks work on uh, readout and control as a capability to control quantum devices from our classical world. Uh, Santa Barbara, also known as Station Q, is, I think, the oldest uh, of our labs. Uh, they work on the theoretical physics, the background behind a lot of our approaches. And Redmond, that's where I'm located. We work on applications, algorithm research, uh, software, a quantum development kit, Azure Quantum. So most of the software team is located in Redmond. 
Okay, another question about um, our team that we often get asked is what kind of background we are looking for when we are hiring? Well, of course, that really, really depends on the kind of work you're looking for. First of all, whether you want to work on the hardware side of thing or the software side of thing. And then if you want to work in one of those teams, basically drilling down to the exact position you want to take, the exact kind of work you want to do, uh, can give you completely different answers to these questions. Now, this is a slide, um, I think about two years old, so the exact numbers might be different, probably are different this time. Um, but when we looked at the degrees that uh, our folks had, most of them were math and physics. And then there was computer science, and then there is electrical engineering. And one interesting thing about us compared to other teams in Microsoft is that Microsoft Quantum is a team that requires quite a lot of expertise. So if we look at the years of work experience, the people on the team do. Most of them have at least five years of experience. I think that includes the time people spend doing their PhDs for those of us who do have PhDs. Um, okay, the next very frequently asked question is the internships, of course. Uh, we started our internship program back in 20. 12. So our program has been with us a lot longer than I have actually been with Microsoft Quantum. And initially it was all research internships. So folks who did uh, algorithmic research. And in 2019, okay, 2018, we added a new direction the engineering internships. Basically, we started a software engineering side of our program for folks um, that would hire folks without quantum computing experience, like me. In 2017, was it? Yes, I think so. And that's when we started doing software engineering that didn't require quantum computing expertise. And that's when we started to have openings for software engineering interns. I really like this part of our program because it allows people who have not yet decided to tie their lives to quantum computing to give it a try and to contribute to our program. And uh, of course, you will know that internships are incredibly valuable for people who get those internships and get a taste of working in a company and solving real world problems and for the team as well. We have a lot of examples of interns who joined our team full time. Since it takes time from the internship to graduation and then to joining the workforce, most of these examples right now are on the research side of the team. Uh, we have one example of somebody who joined after a software engineering internship. You can read more examples at this link. Uh, one problem with the internship that we are facing every year and uh, it's an increasingly big pro problem, it's not scalable. So right now we are looking through the applications for our software uh, engineering internships. And we have a hundred times more applications than actual positions. So you can imagine how hard it is for us to choose which of those amazing folks we want to hire and how hard it is for amazing folks to get hired. So one, Alternatives that I like quite a lot. I come from the software engineering background and before quantum uh, team, I was involved with uh, quite a lot of open source projects. So I really like open source involvement as, well, not 
quite a way to get the experience that the internship does, of course. But to get involved with the team, uh, see what the work is like, see what kind of things they're working on, and uh, actually meet some people from the team. If you work with the team on some open source contribution, you kind of have no choice but to meet the people and see their working styles. And of course, you learn a lot when you do open source contributions. So that's something I highly recommend. There are a lot of programs these days that I'm really happy to see that offer mentorships uh, that are smaller scale compared to complete internships, but programs like uh, QWorld, for example, or um, Unitary Fund, uh, Open Source Foundation um, scholarships. I really love these programs. I'm really hoping that we can do something similar someday. Okay, let's see what's next. Uh -huh. This one is um, to answer the question of um, uh, how we can uh, continue using INQ uh, or other partners' hardware after the hackathon. So if you're working on some kind of project that you would like to keep working on, uh, do some research, wrap it up into a paper maybe, and you need access to quantum hardware for it. We rolled out uh, maybe half a year ago a program called Azure Quantum Credits. So you fill an application and uh, you get credits for use specifically on our partners' quantum devices. Basically, you write up what you want to use them for and if it has like research impact or if you want to do some education using it, teach a course, for example, where you're probably not exactly people who want to teach a course on quantum computing, but uh, sometimes it can be very helpful for professors. Uh, if you want to do something that's going to have commercial impact, uh, these credits are a really good program for you. And uh, there's a link for uh, applying to that program. Oh, and um, we're actually at the last slide. Here is a number of links you can use to uh, follow the announcements our program does to follow me, who does a lot of announcements that our program does. Uh, check out our blogs that also share the news, the technical tips and tricks. I think we have some really interesting things that are going to be rolled out soon. And we announced some things in pretty recent past that are interesting to catch up on. For example, one of the questions I got uh, on Friday was how to get involved with our program in a manner similar to Cascade Advocates program. We don't have a precise match of this program, but what we do have is uh, a section in Microsoft's MVP program, uh, Most Valuable Professional, in which basically people who do amazing things with Microsoft technologies apply and uh, they get the title of Microsoft MVP, they get early access to features, uh, that kind of interesting things. So that one is written up in the Q Sharp blog if you want to learn more about our quantum MVPs. Uh, check that out. Okay, I think this is all I had for you in terms of slides, and we have 15 minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Maria, for, for that talk. We do have questions rolling in, so I'm going to go through them one by one. Um, first question is, does Microsoft plan to expand their quantum team to, for example, Japan? Just wondering, because um, I quantum has presence there, so yeah. Time for a world conquest. Um, I don't know. Uh, we uh, set up our labs basically in places that were uh, universities collaborating with Microsoft for quite a long time. 
so that's how we chose the locations for the labs. And I firmly don't know whether we have any plans or expanding to new locations. That's way above my pay grade. Also, please don't ask me about physics, okay? I'm a software person. I really like keeping my knowledge to uh, software and I just don't follow the physics happenings in our team. So to tap into that extensive knowledge of some of these other questions. Uh, well, actually, the next question is if we have a uh, if we have some project idea um, and we share it, can we get an internship based off of that? What would be the path to develop that project to get to a point where you can get an internship based off of that? Let me think. So for this year, we already have our projects figured out. Uh, usually we do it kind of the other way around. We um, folks in the team think about what kind of projects they would like to offer mentorship on. And then we kind of discuss which of those projects have the most merit for the team. I don't think we often solicit ideas outside the team. So probably a good way to go around it would be to put together a prototype, something like this, to show it. And then kind of for the next year, if we know that you folks have this prototype and it's amazing, and we think this is the best thing that can happen to our program, then we will probably sponsor a project around it. But um, let me think. Yeah, I cannot come up with an example of this happening off the top of my head. So you would be trailblazers. Uh, I'm sure we have some of those uh, trailblazers in, in the audience right now. The next, uh, the next question is, um, Maria, you said that getting involved in open source projects is important for getting a software development position at Microsoft. But what about quantum research positions? Does that advice still apply? Quantum research position, I will admit I have not been following the hiring there very closely. So basically, since our researchers don't work in open source, it's a lot trickier to get in touch with them this way. So I imagine for the research, well, you want to be doing kind of relevant research. So like a PhD in some relevant topic is probably a good idea. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, next question is, uh, since uh, Microsoft's approach is uh, topological quantum computing, do you expect new joiners slash interns to, to know this stuff? Um, where I presume the stuff means the, the physics and, and all that related to it. Uh, right now, the internships we have are on software side and on algorithms research side. I don't think any of them requires knowledge of physics, like specifically topological physics. I'm pretty sure it's all either software or algorithms, not physics. So the, the next question is uh, uh, somewhat related to the previous question, that can we connect with anyone from the Microsoft Quantum team to present um, our quantum projects uh, so that the team can guide us in any way? Uh, so the winners of this uh, hackathon are going to be presenting to Microsoft Quantum team, yes. So if you are looking for some pro to do some project outside of it, outside of the hackathon, I mean, it's a little trickier. We do some uh, guided mentorships sometimes. Again, based off open source. If you check out our blog, you will uh, see some links to blog posts written by our mini mentees, folks who did go through those mini mentorships in the past. 
They are typically focused on, on contributions to our open source repositories, some samples or some tutorials. If it is something that uh, does not fit the open source model, I cannot make any promises. Everybody on the team is so busy that I know folks take uh, their personal time to mentor uh, students on different topics. And I cannot make promises on behalf of my teammates' personal time. A really exciting thing for the winners that I have to look at, look forward to. And it seems like there's a lot of other ways for people to get involved. Um, the next question is, what do you think makes uh, Microsoft's approach to advancing the quantum frontier unique? Um. That feels a lot like a physics question to me. Perhaps touching on the infrastructure stack as well with Azure. Um. Yes, yeah, so our approach is a combination of the desire to provide a diverse uh, quantum ecosystem right now. So we are going to have our partners hardware in Azure Quantum available, which has various underlying uh, physical principles of their devices. And then in the long term, our goal is to build the most scalable system, which uh, might require quite significant physics advances. But kind of in the long run, our goal is to make impact through whichever means are necessary. I'm pretty sure you have heard it from other companies too. So it's hard to enunciate the uniqueness if everybody wants to make impact, right? Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm sure the participants have kind of got a taste for that um, infrastructure and tack it on and hopefully we'll continue to. Uh, so the next question is what is the, what's the most uh, interesting new direction that you've seen in, in quantum algorithm design um, and maybe also like quantum uh, software design? I will admit that I do not follow algorithm advances very well, very closely. Uh, I have an anecdote that my manager, uh, Krista Swari, shared with us, and that was quite some years ago. So she said when she joined uh, quantum computing field, she could just uh, stay up to date with all publications that were done every week, just because there were not a lot of them. Then some years later, she had to stay up to date with just the titles of the publications that have been made, because reading each of them would take too much time. And now, basically, nobody can stay up to date with all the research and advances that are done, just because there is so much growth in the field in that time. It's just not realistic to stay up to date with everything. But the thing that excites me most um, in what I have seen in the five years since I joined uh, the quantum team and the quantum world generally is how much we advanced in terms of helping new people join the field. So when I joined the team, the kind of default way of teaching new people is here's Nielsen and Schwang go ahead. That's not really an efficient way of learning. A book is great, but a book doesn't help you solve problems and make sure that you solve problems correctly. And now, five years forward, there are so many learning materials. There are so many uh, collections of problems with answers and problems that give you feedback on your solutions and you can solve pro programming problems. Again, as a software engineer, for me, learning through programming, through implementing things is the most powerful tool. So for me, this is the most exciting part, things that happened in the past five years, just how much more accessible the field became. 
a great point. I can still remember the first time I read on Mike and Ike. I uh, know there's so many fantastic resources out there. Um, the next question is a fun one. Can you elaborate a bit on your uh, video call uh, background image? Is that some sort of uh, Microsoft lab? Uh, I'm so tempted to say that this is just my bedroom. Yes, it is a photo from one of our labs. And actually, if you see a lot of it, you can even say that it's a European lab because of how the floor looks like. In US, the lab floors look differently. Yeah, it's a photo a couple years old. Somebody from our team who was in a Europe lab took a photo and we use it quite a lot as, back, as a background. Uh, yeah, the next question is a bit more about uh, your journey in uh, quantum computing. How did you get to the point where you are at right now? Um, and just general tips um, for going along the way. With that. Yeah. yeah, my journey to quantum computing was anything but straightforward and direct. I started off back in Ukraine, uh, got my masters in computer science effectively there. I had quite a lot of physics in my uh, courseware, but the quantum part focused strictly on physics. And the idea of using quantum for computation was possibly floated around, but not enunciated. And it definitely didn't sound like something I could do for a living. So for probably about five years after graduating, I worked back in Ukraine in banking software industry. After that, I moved to Microsoft, to US, and spent another um, four years and a change in infrastructure teams. So the underlying layers of what now is Azure. <laughs> Uh, being infrastructure and uh, open source project, uh, Apache open source project called Reef that also was used in the infrastructure layers. And uh, then a friend of mine who is a proper quantum computing researcher recommended me to interview to this team. That was the first time we hired software engineers without quantum computing background. That was the start of our software team. So we hired uh, people to work on the compiler for the quantum language that uh, eventually turned out to be K Sharp. So God did uh, quite a lot of onboarding lectures. Our researchers took turns teaching us. And uh, then we released the first version of the quantum development kit. That was December, 2017, I think. unless I'm missing my years. So a December four years ago, whichever year it was. And uh, after we released it, I figured out that we can do really interesting things with it to facilitate learning quantum computing because of this thing that I said, there were not a lot of learning resources at that point and people would be really excited to use um, the development quantum development kit, but they wouldn't know what to develop with it. So I came up with the project, uh, the quantum cartas, programming tutorials that give you immediate feedback. And uh, then I hosted a programming competition based on those problems. And that's how I ended up in education and outreach. Very cool. Thank you so much for your time, Abrian, uh, in this talk, over the Slack this weekend, and in the tutorial. Um, yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. It, our pleasure to host you. Uh, yeah, thank you for organizing this great hackathon. Yeah, so uh, the next, everyone, the next talk will be um, given by IBM. We'll be starting off uh, uh, right now in a few minutes. So uh, stay tuned and we'll be uh, moving on.
Hi everyone, we'll be pausing this stream for just a little bit. Um, so uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, stay tuned in the Slack uh, and on the Twitch, and we'll be right back. 